As grandson of Samuel Goldwyn, he's a member of one of Hollywood's royal families. You know him as President Fitzgerald Grant on Scandal. And no, he won't give you any inside info. I already tried. Here's Tony Goldwyn. Hello. Um, I am so excited to, be, um, to have been asked to present this year's award for career achievement to my dear friend and brother-in-arms, Richard Lagravenez. You know, <clears throat> it is a rare gift in life to discover that you have a profound connection with someone, both creatively and personally. And Richard is not only the finest writer I've ever worked with, he is one of my dearest friends. And the deeper our creative collaboration goes, so goes our friendship. Working with Richie is, um, it's an exhilarating experience for a director. Jamming, that's what Richie calls the sublime process of sitting for hours, often many, many hours, riffing on a, a theme, on a character, on a new idea, on an old idea, on a bad idea, on a seminal memory or maybe a not so seminal memory. Expelling the crap, the inconsequential ramblings and digging out the nuggets that might actually lead to something good, something exciting, something that we haven't exactly seen before. That singular idea that transcends the cliche and takes flight. Jamming, jazz, that's what working with Richard feels like. It's worth pointing out that, uh, that Rich has no idea how good he really is. It's part of his charm, for those of us who know and love him. <laughs> but his humility is also part of what makes him a great writer. What he does know with absolute, uncompromising certainty is when the music sounds right. And Rich is relentless in his pursuit of the true note. And he won't give up until he hits it. Richie never writes with a destination. He's all about letting the music guide him, letting the characters and the theme tell him where they want to go. He never settles for the familiar idea, the thing he knows will work just because it's worked before. So the result, when you're, you finally finish your jam session, is that no matter what your plan was going in, Richie will return having written something unexpected, something that transcends everything you discussed, something better. You see, that's the thing about working with Richard. He always makes you better. And sometimes I worry about him <clears throat> because this way of working, you know, flying without a net, never allowing yourself to settle for what's expected, comes at a cost. Richie bleeds for the work, often in copious amounts. Not infrequently, it makes him physically ill. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> His family is laughing. And, you know, even with a wife as fiercely loving and supportive as the amazing Anne Lagravenez, <laughs> to help him regain his perspective on the work, to keep his life outside the office from collapsing, to make sure he eats, to fix the computer when it simply will not do what Richie wants, no matter how many times he enters the wrong password. Even though he has Anne and his fabulous daughter, Lily, to shore him up, this process takes its toll. So I worry about my friend. But then I think about Richie's childlike intoxication in the presence of actors. Actors adore Richard, and he adores them. He dotes on them. He relies on them. He takes... He revels in their artistry and has gleeful pride in watching him bring his life to work. He started out as an actor. He still thinks like one. We are his people. And I think about the rush that Rich gets when he's collaborating with a DP or with a designer or with an editor or with a composer. Because the truth is that all the pain 
and all the uncertainty of the birthing process are really washed away by Richard's all-consuming passion for the adventure of filmmaking. And we are here tonight to celebrate the fruits of that passion with the WGAE Career Achievement Award, which is, of course, something really to be proud of. But I imagine it's also a little tricky for someone as young and handsome as Richie. I mean, when you're 80, it's great, right? It's all good. But in your 50s, you might feel a little like that guy in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know, when they're hauling the bodies through the village, screaming, bring out your dead. And the one guy goes, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> anyway, what's so special about this award to me is that being honored by one's fellow writers isn't, isn't just a validation of the past work. It's kind of a shout of encouragement for all the work yet to come. And the other night, we were having dinner, and you said to me that you were feeling like you were entering a new phase in, as a writer, and a more mature phase, but also a rediscovery of that voice that compelled you to write in the first place. And once again, you inspired me with that, because once again, you were not settling for the familiar, for what works, for what, frankly, has made you so successful thus far. You are looking deeper into yourself to be more authentic, to be better. And so the timing here tonight with this award is perfect, because your peers in this room, who face every day the same demons that you face, are telling you to keep going because your voice matters. They honor you because your work inspires them to aim higher, to dig deeper, to not settle for the first idea or the tenth idea, but to wait until the note is true. So look around, brother, <laughs> and take strength from them because we have a lot more jamming to do. It is my great honor to present this year's WGAE Career Achievement Award for my dear friend, Richard Lagravenez. I left my phone on the floor. I was going to use a timer so I don't go too long. Um, <laughs> John Slatterly said he was going to beat me up if I went too long. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Writers Guild East. Uh, this was very kind, Michael and, and Lowell, uh, very generous of you. And thank you, Tony. Thank you for doing this. I, I, uh, I, I, uh, um, <clears throat> I, I got to be honest. I don't think I've done anything all that great to deserve an, an award. Um, and and, um, and I, I don't say that out of false humility. It, it, it's it's, uh, it's something I struggle with. And and um, uh, I'm in a room full of writers, so we can all talk honestly. You know, I, I mean, uh, uh, despair, depression, uh, uh, paralyzing self-doubt, uh, um, what Tony Gilroy and I call Tuesday, uh, uh, basically, uh, is something I constantly, and I was in a really, really fucked up bad depression when I get a call from the Guild saying, hey, we want to give you this achievement award. And, um, uh, and I thought... Um, Okay, you know, irony, yeah, but let me just, uh, let me uh, take a break and see what this kind of means. And I thought, um, um, I thought about it, and I thought, I can use this, uh, I can use this as a ritual for myself, in a way. Um, I, I've never had a lot of confidence, and, I, and I, I started off with an original voice that I kind of abandoned to be something kind of meaningless, uh, this meaningless 90s phrase called an A-list writer, and... Uh, uh, I, I, I so admire people who, who are original and stick to their originality. And I, I did it for a variety of personal reasons. I come from a, a background of, of being, you know, a Brooklyn, Italian-American immigrant mentality. You know, you keep your head down, you don't take, get a lot of attention, and there is such a thing as better people. And, and, um, and uh, because of my wife supporting us, uh, I wrote this original screenplay out of nowhere, and, and suddenly got flown to Hollywood, and I met all these people who believed they were better people. And, um, and I got really fucked up. Um, 
And, and so uh, uh, um, what I decided was um, I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, say some things I could never say before. First of all, uh, I want to thank all the directors who ever, who ever said yes, but most, most especially Terry Gilliam. Because, um, man, if, if it wasn't for Terry, I mean, that would have been like the worst Frank Capra movie you ever saw, kind of. Um, I want to thank all the producers whoever took a chance on me uh, and, and, um, and said yes. And, and most especially, um, Linda Opes, the late Deborah Hill, and, and my adopted sister, uh, Stacey Scher, who also produced Freedom Riders. And I want to thank all the beautiful actors who said yes, all my actors. I, I do love you guys, probably too much to a fault. Um, but most especially, Jeff Bridges and, and Robin Williams. Um, because... Um, Back then, when, when, when Robin Williams said yes to a movie, you know, your life changed. And he gave me a life, and I'll be indebted to them forever. Um, so anyway, I wanted to use this as a ritual for myself. I want to thank the writer that got me here, the guy that got me here. He's a really good guy, a little too much of a people pleaser, you know, a little, little too much of a needing to belong. All the things you should not use your creativity for. Everybody in this room writers, anybody who creates, you all deserve, we all deserve that recognition and respect because the, the effort to create something and put it out there and have everybody look at it and criticize it or reject it or approve of it, that's brave, man. And everyone in this room deserves recognition and respect for that. Um, so I want to I wanna say thanks to that writer and I want to say goodbye. I want to say goodbye. He's got to go. Because um, new stuff has to happen. Uh, creatively, you've got to keep reinventing. I want to recreate or reinvent this, this relationship to my imagination I have. And I don't even know if film is the right medium for me. I, I, I always feel I'm not really quite sure. Because um, I overwrite everything, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm just beginning to understand how to tell a story in image and word. It, it's, it's, some people have it just naturally in their DNA and I'm just beginning to understand it. Um, so I wanna, I wanna start fresh and I wanna be an amateur and I wanna keep listening and, and see where it all goes. I don't know if this new stuff will be of any interest to anybody but I guess that's the point. I'm reading this book called The Myth of Sisyphus and um, you know you're depressed when Camus makes you feel better. It's like, you know. <laughs> Um, no future, no hope. <laughs> um, I feel like relieved. It's amazing. This thing's blowing my mind. Anyway, Sisyphus was, you know, condemned by the gods to push this rock up a hill and have it fall down for eternity. Writing. Um, and, and the idea is love the pushing of the rock. Love pushing the rock. Love the struggle. Love the creative. That's it. We have no control over a fucking box office or, or what they want or they say or whatever it is. Love the pushing. Love the creating. That's what I want to do now and see what happens. And I want to thank my friends, my wife Anne, my daughter Lily, and all of you. Thank you very, very, very much. <laughs>